Chapter 64 Anointing for Life The year was 1953. Strangers intruding upon his privacy were not the only stresses William Branham had to deal with at home during that summer of 1953. Recently, his son had started rebelling against his strict Christian upbringing. Like many teenagers, Billy Paul wanted to live his life without responsibilities or restrictions. Unfortunately, this attitude was tempting him down a dangerous path. Bill looked for the right moment to bring the matter up with his son. One night while Bill was praying, he saw a vision of his son at a booze party, jumping out of a window and tumbling head over heels toward the ground, out of control. In terror, Bill cried out, Oh God, don't let him die. He's the only boy I've got. The vision ended with an inconclusive snap, jerking Bill alert, his temples dripping sweat. He prayed, Lord, please don't let my son be killed like that. Sometime after midnight, Billy Paul tiptoed into the house with the smell of beer on his breath. The next morning, Bill let his son sleep as long as he wanted. When Billy Paul got up around 10 o'clock, his first thought was to go visit a friend. Bill was washing his car in the driveway when Billy Paul sauntered out of the front door. Bill shut off the hose and said, You got in late last night, didn't you, son? Do you want me to tell you where you were? No, sir, Paul replied. He knew his father could do it. You're starting down the wrong road, Paul. Dad, I want to see what it's like out there. Son, do you believe your daddy loves you? I know you do. Good, because what I'm going to tell you, I'm saying in love. I can't have you working in the meetings anymore because it reflects badly on my ministry. Not only that, you can't live like that and still stay here. Daddy, I want to leave home anyway. I want to see what the world is all about. Don't do that, Paul. Sin will take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. If you let it, sin will take control of your life and it could end up costing you far more than you want to pay. Daddy, I want to go. Before you go, do me a favor. Hold up your arms like this. Bill spread his arms straight away from his sides. Billy Paul did as his father asked. Bill said, Now turn around and look at the wall behind you. Your shadow is forming a cross. Two roads intersect at the center of that cross. One road leads to heaven. The other leads to hell. You can't walk both roads at the same time. Today you are standing at that crossroad. I can tell you what is right, but you've got to make that choice yourself. If you start down the wrong road, somewhere along the road God is going to turn you around because I claim you under the token. It might be a rough road back, but it's your decision. Billy Paul chose the wrong road. Several days later, Dr. Pillay, the Archbishop of the Presbyterian Church in India, stopped by Bill's house to try to persuade him to hold a healing campaign in India. Bill and Mita were getting ready to take their girls to the dentist in New Albany, so Bill asked the Archbishop to come along. While Mita took Rebecca and Sarah into the dentist's office, Bill and Dr. Pillay sat in the car discussing the archbishop's proposal. Suddenly, Bill felt impressed to get out of the car. He ignored the feeling. Presently, he heard a voice whisper, Get out of the car immediately. Now he knew the Lord wanted to speak to him alone. Excusing himself, Bill got out and walked down the street. Soon the angel of the Lord said, Return home as fast as you can. Billy Paul is in trouble. Arriving home, Bill found his mother-in-law standing on the front porch, sobbing hysterically. Billy Paul is in the hospital, dying. Bill calmed her down enough to get the story. Billy Paul had been staying with her. Yesterday, he went fishing and fell in the lake. This morning, he complained about a sore throat. So Mrs. Broy urged him to go see Dr. Adair. The doctor gave him a shot of penicillin, not knowing until it was too late that Billy Paul was violently allergic to penicillin. Shortly after the antibiotic entered his bloodstream, his heart stopped. Dr. Adair revived him with a shot of adrenaline, but his allergic reaction continued. An ambulance rushed Paul to the hospital where the doctors were now struggling to keep him alive. When Bill reached the hospital, he ran towards the emergency room and met Dr. Adair in the hallway. Dr. Adair said, I didn't know he'd be allergic to penicillin. I've given it to him before, and he didn't have a reaction but this time he did. We've given him three shots of adrenaline, but his pulse keeps dropping. I'm sorry, Bill. 
I may have killed your boy. Doc, you're my friend. I know you've done your best to save him. Can I see him? We've got a tube in him, and he's unconscious, but go ahead. Bill walked into the emergency room and shut the door. Billy Paul lay on his back with a plastic tube threaded into his nose. His body was swollen, and his skin looked a deathly blue, except the skin around his eyes, which was black. His jaw hung slack, leaving his mouth wide open. Life support machines gurgled and whirred softly in the background. Dropping to his knees, Bill prayed desperately. Dear God, as far as medical science is concerned, my son is gone. But I am asking you to be merciful and don't let him go. Minutes passed, then he saw the same vision he had seen a few days earlier, only this time with a twist. He saw Billy Paul jumping out that window, saw him tumbling head over heels through the air. But this time he saw two strong arms reach out, catch him, and lift him back up to the window. Then he heard Billy Paul say, Daddy, where am I? That was not part of the vision. Bill rose from his knees and stood beside the bed. You're in the hospital, Paul. Don't worry. Everything is all right now. A few minutes later, Bill called for the nurse. Billy Paul wanted the tube taken out of his nose. When the nurse checked the boy's pulse, she found it was normal. Unfortunately, this brush with death did not cause Billy Paul to repent. After his release from the hospital, he slipped right back into his wrong-headed ways, frequenting pool halls, drinking, smoking, playing poker, and gambling. It would take a much stronger lesson to show him the right road. That lesson was not long in coming. On September 13, 1953, Billy Paul turned 18. In October, Bill took his family to Colorado for a vacation. Since Billy Paul was living on his own and not keeping in touch with his parents, neither Bill nor Mita knew their son was having health problems when they left on their trip. Paul was bleeding inside. He ignored his symptoms for as long as he dared, going to see a doctor only after the pain in his stomach doubled him over. Immediately, Dr. Brennan admitted him to a hospital. Billy Paul's condition was critical. He had developed intestinal ulcers, possibly caused by the alcohol he had been drinking so heavily. The bleeding alone posed a serious threat to his health. Even worse, scar tissue had formed over one ulcer, blocking his intestines, cutting off the circulation and killing cell tissue. Gangrene had set in. Dr. Brenner warned him of the danger, advising him that a colostomy needed to be done soon or he would die. Billy Paul stalled. He wanted desperately to get a message to his father, thinking that if only his father could pray for him, then everything would be all right. He had seen it happen in his father's faith healing campaigns and at home, miracle after miracle, hundreds upon hundreds of times. Why couldn't it happen to him? Surely it would happen if only his father was there to pray, but no one knew exactly where his father was or when he would return. After a delay of several days, Dr. Brenner insisted that the operation could not safely be postponed any longer. Paul's life was at stake. Reluctantly, Mrs. Broy signed permission for Dr. Brenner to operate on her grandson. The next morning, as Billy Paul waited nervously for his operation, he lamented his fate. Within an hour, Dr. Brennan was going to remove part of his bowels and feed the open end out through a hole in his abdomen into a plastic bag. For the rest of his life, he would be doomed to wear that plastic bag. He thought about what his father had told him. Sin will end up costing you far more than you want to pay. Oh, why had he turned his back on the Lord Jesus Christ? He felt a hand on his shoulder and heard his father's voice. Hi, Paul. Relief swept over him. Daddy, I've been trying so hard to reach you. Where have you been? I was vacationing with the family in Colorado. Paul, remember that night in Vandalia, Illinois, when God let you see his angel? Billy Paul recalled the swirling wisp of fire that he had seen form into a man. The angel had stood in the corner of their hotel room with his arms folded across his chest. How well he remembered that face, so stern and powerful. How could I ever forget that night, Daddy? That same angel met me in the Colorado Rockies and said, Go to Billy right away. He's in trouble. Son, the way of a transgressor is hard. Pray for me, Daddy. Bill shook his head. Not yet, son. I didn't do the sinning. You did. 
First, you need to ask God to forgive you. If you're ready to make Jesus Christ your Lord, I believe he will heal you. There in his hospital bed, Billy Paul turned around, went back to the center of that crossroad, and this time he chose the right road, the one that leads to eternal life. Then his father prayed for his healing. When Dr. Brenner came in to see his patient before the operation, Bill asked him to examine Paul one more time. After numerous tests, Dr. Brenner said, Reverend Branham, I don't understand it. Your son has quit bleeding and I can't find any trace of gangrenous infection. It's like a miracle happened. And you don't know the best part, Bill said. Paul had left the Lord Jesus Christ, but today he came back. That is the greatest miracle of all. In November of 1953, William Branham held a nine-day faith healing campaign in Owensboro, Kentucky. Then on November 29th, he started a long campaign in Palm Beach, Florida. While he was in Palm Beach, Gordon Lindsay called to ask him if he would speak at the Voice of Healing Convention in Chicago on Friday night, December 11th. Bill had planned on being in Palm Beach until December 15th, but because last summer he had promised Lindsay, and also Joseph Matson bose that he would speak in Chicago at the Voice of Healing Convention, he agreed to cut his Florida meeting short. As soon as he finished talking with Lindsay, he called Matson bose to let his friend know the day he would be in Chicago. Since he would only be speaking one night at the convention, Matson bose asked if he would preach Saturday night and Sunday morning at the Philadelphia Church in Chicago. Bill said he would be glad to do it. He finished in West Palm Beach on the evening of December 6th, That same night, he and Billy Paul, who was again helping him in his campaigns, left for home. Taking turns, they drove straight through the night and the next day, arriving home around three o'clock the following morning. As Bill was getting ready for bed, the angel of the Lord entered his bedroom and said, Something is wrong in Chicago. Bill asked, Is it in the Philadelphia church? No, said the angel as he opened a vision. Bill saw Gordon Lindsay, editor of the Voice of Healing magazine, turn to another man and say, Go tell Brother Branham that, but don't let him know I had anything to do with it. When the vision faded, the angel said, That man is going to confront you at the convention and take you out of the meeting. The angel vanished before Bill could ask another question, leaving him wondering what it meant. On December 11, 1953, Bill arrived at the Voice of Healing convention 45 minutes before his time to speak. A man named Velmar Gardner met him at the door, took him by the arm, and hurried him through the lobby into a side room. Gardner seemed eager to shut the door. Soon another man came in and introduced himself as Reverend Hall from the Voice of Healing magazine. Bill recognized Mr. Hall as the man who Gordon Lindsay had talked to in the vision. Gravely, Reverend Hall said, Brother Branham, we hear you are planning to speak at the Philadelphia Church tomorrow night and Sunday. The Voice of Healing has decided that if you preach for Joseph Matson bose then we won't permit you to speak tonight at this convention. What is wrong with preaching for Brother bose Well, some of the churches in Chicago don't like him, and to keep unity at our convention here, we just made this decision. What do you mean by we? The Board of Directors at the Voice of Healing... Gordon Lindsay didn't have anything to do with it. Bill knew better. Now he could see what this was all about. The whole thing stunk of politics. The Voice of Healing organization and some Chicago churches were trying to pressure him into conforming to their ideas. If he had not weathered that storm in South Africa, he might have buckled under this pressure now. He remembered what the angel told him the night he was healed of amoebas. Do just as you feel led. Way last summer, I promised Brother Bose I would hold at least one meeting for him during the time of this convention, and I'm going to keep my promise. Then you can't speak tonight. Fine with me. I'll just go in and listen to the service. Getting up, Bill opened the door. Before he got two steps away from that room, Gardner and Hall caught his arms and hustled him through the lobby toward the exit. The doors to the convention hall were open, and Bill heard someone announce, We're sorry to say Brother Branham will not be speaking tonight. He has a brother who is sick, and so he couldn't come. How cleverly stated, because it was partly true. Bill's brother, Howard, was sick. Not long ago, the Lord had shown Bill a vision of their father, Charles, descending from heaven and marking out the grave where Howard would be buried. 
But Bill didn't know when his brother would die, nor had Howard's illness influenced this trip to Chicago in any way. It was another lesson in how strongly church politics could affect his ministry, regardless of how hard he tried to stay above it. And he had tried. Not only were all of his meetings interdenominational, he purposely kept his preaching simple to avoid offending the many different denominational ministers who supported his campaigns. He always preached on salvation and healing through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, themes which most Christians could at least come close to agreeing on. Whenever he had a burden to preach something beyond this, he did it at his home church in Jeffersonville, Indiana. But in an international ministry like his, because it was impossible to please everyone, it was also hard to avoid the pitfalls of church politics. His experience at this Voice of Healing convention made that painfully clear. As soon as William Branham got home from Chicago, he learned that George Wright was dying. Without even taking time to unpack, Bill got in his car and headed for Milltown. George Wright had been his friend since the early days of his ministry. Over the years, Bill had spent many pleasant hours on the Wright farm, tramping through the wooded hills, hunting squirrels and rabbits. They had enjoyed many good meals together and discussed many Bible questions around the Wright's kitchen table. Together they had shared many adventures. George had even accompanied Bill on the night Georgia Carter was healed from tuberculosis after spending nine years in bed. By the time Bill turned down the familiar country road leading to the Wright's farm, he was misty inside with nostalgia. George Wright was so glad to see Bill that he tried to walk too fast and went into a fit of coughing, spitting up blood. When his voice returned, he said slowly, Oh, Brother Branham, we tried to reach you in Chicago. Did you get our telegram? No, Brother George, it never got to me. What is your condition? Blood clot started in my legs, then lodged in my knees. A specialist came out from Louisville to examine me. He said I've got only three or four more days to live. He said that when those clots dislodge, they'll either go to my brain and paralyze me, or else they'll go to my heart and kill me outright. Falling across the bed, Bill begged God to let George live. He stayed at the Wright farm several more days, continuing to pray for his old friend. Early each morning, he shouldered his shotgun and trudged up the snowy wooded hill behind the house, hunting for rabbits. On the third morning, coming back down the hill, Bill counted ten cars parked in the yard. He knew what that meant. The public had discovered he was here and people were coming for prayer. In all good conscience, he couldn't stay at the Wright's farm any longer. Mrs. Wright did not need a gaggle of strangers around her door at a stressful time like this. While he was packing his clothes, Mita called him on the telephone. Bill, you need to come home right away. Mrs. Baker, that Jewish widow who does Christian missionary work here in town, wants you to pray for her daughter. He knew Mrs. Baker's daughter, whose first baby boy was born with clubbed feet and had been healed after Bill had prayed for him. Mrs. Baker he knew by reputation, because she was sometimes mentioned in the local newspaper. Formerly an ardent Jew, she converted to Christianity, attended Moody Bible Institute of Chicago, graduated with honors, moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and for many years had been an active missionary among the Jewish population in the area. I was just planning on leaving here anyway, Bill said. What is the matter with Mrs. Baker's daughter? She's just had a baby and some complications developed. Mrs. Baker called it septicemia. I guess that means blood poisoning. The baby is all right, but the young mother is in critical condition. She's over at the Baptist Hospital. I'll stop by there before I come home, Bill said. Shelby Wright, George's 40-year-old son, carried Bill's suitcase out to the car, which was parked by a giant willow tree in the front yard. Shelby said, Brother Branham, I know you've been trying to give Mom hope, but what do you really think about Dad? Is he going to die? Yes, Shelby, I believe your daddy is going to die. He's 72 years old. God only promised him 70 years. I've asked God to spare him, but God hasn't answered me a word about it. George is a Christian, so he's ready to go. Now I suppose God is going to take him home. Oh, I know Daddy's ready to go. But you know what bothers me the most? For years, Dad has testified to everyone around Milltown that God is a healer. Now some of those people are mocking him, saying if God is such a healer, why doesn't he just dissolve those blood clots? 
and the man who's laughing the loudest is the Church of Christ minister. That afternoon, Bill stopped at the Baptist Hospital. Mrs. Baker was standing in the hall outside her daughter's room, fussing with another woman and a Catholic priest. As Bill walked up, the other woman said to Mrs. Baker, But she's my daughter-in-law, and I don't want her to go to hell. I want my priest to anoint her for death. Just a moment, Bill interposed. You should let me go in first. I'm Brother Branham, and I've come to anoint the girl for life. This really sent the mother-in-law into a tizzy. Bill suggested, Why don't you let her husband decide? The husband, a man in his twenties, definitely preferred Bill to go in first and anoint his wife for life. Grumbling, the mother-in-law stepped aside to let Bill pass. The young mother was lying in a coma, her soul fluttering between life and death. Bill knelt by her bed and spent ten minutes asking Jesus Christ to be merciful and let her live. Finally, he stood up, wiped a tear from his eye, and picked up his hat and overcoat. Before he could leave, the pillar of fire appeared over the young woman's bed. Instantly, the light drew him into a vision. He saw the same young mother standing in her kitchen, stirring a pot of soup. She looked down at a rambunctious little boy, put her finger to her lips, and said, "Shh, the baby is sleeping." Then the vision left him. Smiling with confidence, Bill strode out into the hallway. There stood the doctor, the husband, the priest, and the two grandmothers, all in a group. Bill said to the husband, "I have some good news for you, son." Thus saith the Lord, your wife is going to be all right. Tonight she's going to get worse, but in the morning she'll start getting better. Within thirty-six hours she'll be well enough to go home. If she isn't, then I'm a false prophet. While Mrs. Baker and her son-in-law rejoiced, the priest looked quizzically at the doctor, who shook his head and walked away. Scowling, the mother-in-law snapped, "Son, haven't we had about enough of this nonsense? It's time for the priest to anoint her for death." The young husband wouldn't let the priest go in. He said to his mother-in-law, "Do you remember when my first boy was born with clubbed feet? I took him over to Brother Branham's house for prayer. Brother Branham saw a vision and said that within 24 hours my baby's feet would be straightened. The next morning we ran to his crib and it was just the way Brother Branham said it would be. If Brother Branham says, 'Thus saith the Lord, in 36 hours my wife is going home well,' then goodbye." I'm going home to get the house ready for her. As Bill was leaving the Baptist Hospital, Charlie McDowell met him on the front steps and begged him to ride with him over to Frankfort, Kentucky, to pray for his mother. Doctors had just operated on the 61-year-old woman for cancer. They found her body so full of malignancy they didn't even bother to sew her back up. They just taped the incision closed because she would be dead in a few hours anyway. It was late at night when Charlie McDowell and Bill got to Frankfort. At the hospital, Bill simply laid his hands on Mrs. McDowell and asked for her healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Then he left, getting home around five o'clock in the morning. Several strangers were sleeping on his doorstep, waiting for him. Obligingly, he prayed for each one, then dropped into bed exhausted. A few hours later, sunlight woke him up. It was nine o'clock Monday morning, December twenty-eighth, nineteen fifty-three. Slipping his bathrobe over his pajamas, he walked down the hall towards the bathroom. When he passed by the doorway to the living room, he was surprised to see an attractive young woman standing there. He said, "Good morning, ma'am. What are you doing in here?" She didn't speak to him. Instead, she turned her head and spoke to someone in the kitchen. Bill looked to see who it was. That is when he realized this was a vision, because the kitchen he saw was not his kitchen. Mrs. McDowell stood there, leaning against some of her kitchen cabinets, talking on the telephone. Bill thought to himself, "That's the woman I prayed for last night." Just then, he heard an unusual noise behind him. Puzzled, he turned to see what it could be. There stood a weeping willow tree. Yellow clods of clay were falling from the sky, making a plop, plop sound as they filled a large rectangular hole at the base of the tree. There was something about those willow branches that looked familiar. Yes, it was the willow tree that stood by George Wright's house. He heard the angel of the Lord say something about graves, but he didn't catch what it was. So he asked God to repeat the vision. Suddenly, he was standing behind the pulpit of his church in Jeffersonville. George Wright came in the main door, walked down the aisle, and shook Bill's hand. The angel said, "Thus saith the Lord." 
George Wright will dig the graves of those who are laughing at him. Now Bill understood that George was going to be all right. After breakfast, he called Charlie McDowell to tell him his mother would be coming home from the hospital. Then he called the Wrights. Shelby answered the phone. Brother Branham, Dad is almost paralyzed this morning. It doesn't matter. He's going to be all right. Go tell your daddy I have thus saith the Lord for him. He is going to dig the graves of those people who are laughing at him. Brother Branham, did you know that my dad sometimes works at the cemetery as a grave digger? No, Shelby, I didn't know that. But now that he did know, the vision made more sense. Detail by detail, the visions became reality. Mrs. McDowell felt better immediately. Her doctor examined her again and was shocked when he could not find any cancer. In fact, her case baffled the entire hospital staff. A week after she was prayed for, she went home and resumed her normal chores. Every day she enjoyed a long telephone conversation with her daughter, just like Bill had seen her doing in the vision. Two days after Bill told George Wright, Thus saith the Lord, the blood clots in his knees dissolved harmlessly. After that, he quickly recovered his health. One Sunday morning, he opened the door of Branham Tabernacle, walked down the aisle to the front and shook Bill's hand, just like Bill had seen him do in the vision. Concerning those that had mocked him during his illness because he had testified that Jesus Christ is a healer, within a year he saw five of them buried, including the Church of Christ minister. George Wright lived well into his 90s. As for the young mother dying from septicemia, the next morning her blood tested free from toxins. The following morning she took her newborn baby home from the hospital. Mrs. Baker sang for joy. In her missionary work, she zealously testified how Jesus Christ had healed her daughter. Soon the Christian organization that sponsored her withdrew its financial support. An officer of the organization explained, We don't have anything against William Branham, but neither do we want our program entangled in the controversy surrounding divine healing. When Bill heard this, he said, Then they are out of God's program. Signs and wonders will always vindicate God's program. As long as there is a world, there will be a supernatural God here to control things, and he will always have somebody he can put his hands on. Tonight he's got a church all around the world. His church has a lot of things about it that's got to be ironed out. I can't iron them out. No man can. That's God's business. He will take care of it. No matter how many man-made programs rise up, every one of them will fall. God himself will set up his program. As far as I know, his program is for people to be baptized into Jesus Christ and be led by the Holy Spirit, free from condemnation.